Well, um, great. Before we start, uh, blockchain seems to be the buzzword nowadays, so I'm assuming that everyone heard it before coming to the conference, but a quick raise of hands. So before coming to the conference, who heard of blockchain? Almost everyone. Um, uh, who would be comfortable to explain it to somebody else? Okay. <laughs> So I think we will see a big change uh, over the next few years. So um, yeah, what's blockchain? Let's start with um, why the internet is broken. Because the internet we have today, uh, it um, solved so many problems, but it brought new ones. And the internet we have today is broken for many reasons. Two of them are uh, we do not own our data most of the times. Our private data, our company data, is usually not where we are in control of it. And the other thing is that it's really hard to make money on the internet uh, with content that you produce. Monetizing is difficult, and I guess um, uh, this is uh, so we can make money through indirect channels. And um, blockchain is a key technology in the next generation internet that could solve, if we do it right, many of these problems. Um, but before we look at blockchain, we would have to look into the history of the internet to understand where we come from. So if we look back to the 90s, and we had that uh, talk earlier, I guess, uh, we used to call it, uh, the, the World Wide Web revolutionized uh, the internet, and we used to call it the information data highway. Those who are old enough will remember. Um, uh, it's a word we would never use because it has become normal to be connected, um, to be interconnected and, and send data from one computer to the other. Um, it, while it was revolutionary to connect the computers and it radically reduced the transaction costs of communication, um, it has become very normal. About 10 years later, we had the next revolution. It was less technical, it was an evolution. The internet became more mature, we could, it became more programmable, and we could start building complex applications on top of it. And what it brought was, on the one hand, social media, starting with MySpace and Facebook and Twitter and everything that came afterwards, uh, the knowledge platforms, Wikipedia and the e-commerce platforms. Um, and uh, who would have thought people were skeptic when Amazon started selling books? They said, like, nobody's going to buy a book online, right? And now we've reached the sharing economy with Airbnb, Uber, and everything that followed. So the Web 2 really brought us all together. It created this peer-to-peer -peer economy, but always with one platform in the middle, with one player who's very concentrated, uh, who controls all our data and determines all the rules of the transactions, centralized. And so blockchain in this context could be seen as the driving force of the next generation internet. Some talk about, uh, refer to it as the Web3. Some refer to it as the decentralized web. And what blockchain does is it enables us to have true peer-to-peer -peer transactions without the need for a trusted third party in the middle. And it all started um, with Bitcoin. And Bitcoin is money without banks and bank managers. Bitcoin is, the idea of Bitcoin was to have trusted money transfer between two people who do not know and trust each other without the need of a bank. Because if, I don't know you, you're sitting here in the second row, I don't know you. If I were to buy something online from you, um, I would need to send you money. So you want to make sure that I actually have that money or the credit line, and I want to make sure that uh, um, the money arrives and that you, that you don't falsely claim that you didn't get it, so I have to send it again. So in order to avoid these kind of double, sending problems, uh, double spending problems, we need a bank, a credit card company, PayPal, they all have the same function to act as a trusted third party between two people who do not know and do not trust each other. Now, Bitcoin came and said, let's create um, a protocol that enables us to have true peer-to-peer -peer money transfer without the need of that trusted third party of a bank. And uh, the technology behind this is blockchain. And 
After some time, people took this technology, it's open source, anyone can take it, fork it, do their better creation version of Bitcoin, a uh, faster one, a more secure one, um, a more sc scalable one, etc. Um, and then people started realizing that you can actually take this protocol and try and have any kind of modified in a way where we could have any kind of value transactions without the middleman, not only peer-to-peer -peer money, but also peer-to-peer -peer energy trading of neighbors uh, producing uh, energy on, on, uh, on their roofs with solar panels without the need of an energy company uh, acting as a trusted intermediary for exchanging that energy. We could have uh, ride sharing without Uber, apartment sharing without Airbnb, um, book selling without Amazon. So this all is really possible with blockchain and the other technologies in this decentralized web stack that we're currently building. So why wasn't that possible before? Because we first had the computer, uh, and uh, they looked like this, even bigger before that. And then we had the internet. So when the internet started to become a mass phenomenon in the 90s, uh, we started to connect all those standalone computers. And um, while we've connected more and more devices over those last 30 years, first the big computers, then the small computers, then the handhelds, and we've reached Internet of Things now. Um, we do live in this ever-connected world, but data um, is kind of transferred in this very old-fashioned uh, with this uh, old-fashioned internet protocol that revolutionized things back then, uh, the so-called client-server protocol, where data is stored centrally on one computer, on the server, and it is like uh, retrieved from another device uh, or sent to from another device over the IP protocol. So that means that today, even though we live con in this connected world, data storage is local or central on a device. Could be our big or small computers, mobile phones, could be the stick, or even in the cloud. Even if it's not remote, if it's somewhere else, it's still centrally stored over there. And this brings a lot of questions of who owns my data, who verifies uh, the transactions that run through these servers, and um, is my data safe? Uh, what about security? Can I trust those entities that own my data? So basically, I guess this is why The Economist two years ago called blockchain the trust machine, because what blockchain enables or provides is a protocol of trust. It's kind of a protocol that runs on top of the internet um, that enables this peer-to-peer -peer trust transactions, or trustless trust, actually. It decentralizes trust, and it, it allows us to move away from a world where we live today. You can see, yeah, the world of data monarchy, the server, uh, is that central entity where all our data is stored. And we heard that before, like uh, from Adobe, right? Uh, basically, a digital file is nothing else than um, we took the documents and instead of writing them with ink on paper, we now have them like with letters, but it's like stupid documents, right? And we send them. When I send you an email, when I send you a PDF, I create a copy and the copy arrives at your computer. So I do not control that copy anymore. I could write some copyright statements on top of it, but I don't know what happens with that copy. Um, blockchain and the decentralized web and many of those peer-to-peer -peer technologies, um, they run on a peer-to-peer -peer network of computers. And when I send you money over Bitcoin, it's not the bank verifying whether I have enough money and you are you, and you re really received your money or you, uh, through a central server, but it's the peer-to-peer -peer network of computers who will all downloaded the code, and if the majority of the network says, yes, the transaction is valid, it's validated, and the transaction gets automatically enforced on the fly. By, and this is kind of the core, also killer application is the smart contract. And unfortunately, the smart contract is a bit of a, an unfortunate term because it's neither very smart, nor is it a contract in a legal way. Uh, it's basically a piece of code or a digital handshake. It's like a piece of code running on top of this peer-to-peer -peer blockchain network. 
and where you, um, where you define the terms of the transactions beforehand in the code, and the peer-to-peer -peer network checks whether the terms are true uh, or have been met, and if yes, um, the transaction is automatically enforced. And this is revolutionary because it radically reduces transaction costs and it allows us to have auditing and accounting um, on the fly and enforcement on the fly. So we are entering the era of this new decentralized web stack or web and we're just starting to build the technologies around it because blockchain really is only one of many technologies we will need. For example, we can't save data on the blockchain. Blockchain is great for validating transactions. It's like this online distributed timestamp of who did what. But um, we, wouldn't, we would need other protocols and we're building them, IPFS, to store that data, etc. So we're basically, now that our, we've been connected for the last 30 years, we're reinventing the internet and the computer. And the blockchain could be seen like a super big decentralized world computer. We're reinventing our data structures. Why is that important? Because it refers to what I said earlier, why the internet is broken in a way. Because today, we live in a world of data chaos and data slavery. What does that mean? Data chaos means that we have username and password jungle. Do you know how many identities you have online? <laughs> how many new username and passwords you have? Just a guess. Can I hear some numbers? 60, 50, 200. So I checked. Uh, I have almost 300 that I found in my password manager. This is amazing. And, and so, either, so w what are we forced to do today? Either you, you need to, um, like most people would use the same username and password for most of their probably non-critical stuff, right? Which is not very safe. You should never do that, but I know a lot of people who do that. Or you could use a password manager. But in our centralized world, it's basically um, a, a, a service that you need to trust them. It's a trusted third party. And we've had instances a few weeks ago of one of those providers being hacked and the password managers and all those passwords being hacked. So this is basically a very inconvenient way because of the way our data structures are of sending files from A to B and having complete data redundancy. Um, we need usernames and passwords for every single service we, we sign up to. It's inconvenient also because every time my address changes, my phone number changes, or my credit card is, gets expired and I have to update it, I have to go to every service and update that manually everywhere. So that's the data chaos part. And the data slavery part, and I know it's a very harsh word, but let's face it, every time we upload data to Facebook, Twitter, um, Dropbox, um, our bank, um, we lose control over our data. We may trust them, we may not trust them, but we do lose ownership and, um, over our data. And we don't know what happens, and we're forced to trust them or not trust them. That's basically the only choice that we have. And we pay with our privacy. Tomorrow, we could live in a world if uh, we, we have this small time window with uh, blockchain and the decentralized web just emerging right now. We have this small time frame window to get it right because tomorrow we could live in a world where we own our own data. And um, yeah, in a world of smart data. And I'm, um, it's been said before, I just recently started to get involved with one of those companies that, that works with that, Yolocom, it's a Berlin-based um, identity, decentralized identity uh, startup. And what we're trying to do there is to provide services, uh, system architecture and applications where you choose where your data is stored and you're always in full control of your data with your private key, which is basically like a crypt cryptographic password. You don't have a password jungle anymore because it's single sign-on, just like Facebook, but you own your data. Like your private data is, is stored in a personal 
data store. It could be on your physical device, it could be on a virtual server that you only you control with a private key, or it could even be on IPFS or Swarm in a peer-to-peer -peer network. Um, you choose where you want to store your data, and you never send your data from A to B. You just verify information about yourself. So it's a completely new password, uh, a completely new concept. So we will be able to avoid password jungles, and in the end, you will only have one private key, and your identity is yours again. I think the big keyword here is privacy by design. We have a chance to reinvent the inter internet right now, and we're all doing it, all the startups that are involved in it, and it's more and more people who are getting on board. And we need to make sure that we have privacy by design. Um, why? Because it's very early. It's like 1990 for the internet, and maybe even 1960 for the computer. So it's like when, I don't know, those who remember that when you used to dial into the internet and the pages, took like, you could look like um, pixel by pixel how the page was building up. It's like when you're looking at how transactions get through the blockchain, if you participate in an ICO, it's almost like that, right? Um, so it's very early stages for, for the internet, uh, where the internet used to look like this. And email back then was the first application in the internet, of the internet. And back then many people thought, oh, email is the internet. We didn't anticipate that we would have the World Wide Web and Amazon and Facebook and smartphones and everything that came after. We were already like really buzzed by having email. And just as email was the first killer application, Bitcoin is kind of the first killer application of the decentralized web in a way. But we need, uh, we have this small time window to get it right. Because blockchain is a very, very, very powerful technology. It, we could use it in a good way to create a universal freedom machine, uh, to, to enable a peer-to-peer -peer society, an egalitarian peer-to-peer -peer society. Um, if we don't do it right, um, we could end up here um, and create the universal control machine, not only with blockchain, but also in the intersection of AI and Internet of Things, all these technologies will converge and will play along each other. And they're super powerful. I think we have no idea what world we will live in in 10 years. Um, it's, it's, it will be a massive shift. And uh, let's try to do it right. And if you are interested to find out more about blockchain and the decentralized web, we have tons of material online. So uh, get online, start following us, and learn about um, what you can do to contribute to make the world better. Thank you.